to our session on global regulatory developments. On behalf of Rec Horizon and ETH Zurich, it's my pleasure to have you join us today. For those of you just joining us now, my name is Aisha Piotti. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Rec Horizon, and I will be your host for this session. Now, those of you following this topic know that in the last year or two, we have seen significant shift in the AI debate from the need to put in place ethical frameworks and principles around AI to the need for binding regulations in this area. Indeed, in April this year, we saw the publication of the draft EU AI Act by the European Commission, which is now expected to be discussed before it is finalized into law and subsequently adopted by the 27 member states of the EU. It is important to highlight the extraterritorial reach of the EU draft proposal, which makes it very important for businesses, communities outside the EU to also be aware of these developments and if possible, also to provide their input into the discussion. At the same time, the Council of Europe, which represents 47 member states, recently announced that it will be negotiating a global treaty on AI within a year or two. And more recently, we have also seen calls in the US for a coherent set of rules around AI. And many governments across the globe have published their national strategies in AI, which include regulatory elements as well. So the topic of AI regulation is relevant across all geographies and it cuts across all sectors of society, private and public, big and small. Hence, the aim of our discussion today is to provide you with an overview of the approach of the different global players on AI regulation. We will hear from the EU, the United States, the Council of Europe, and also Switzerland, a very European country, which is not a member of the European Union. But instead of discussing intricate details of the proposal, the focus, however, will be on the similarities and differences in the approaches being followed. Our second objective is to explore together a few ideas on what more can be done, in particular, to align AI towards the long-term benefit of society. So here we will reframe the question slightly and ask how policy can help guide AI towards the good of society. Or in other words, how can policy incentivize ethical and lawful development of AI? So a very quick reminder on how we will proceed. Um, the session will run for two hours. We will start with a keynote speech, followed directly by a high-level panel discussion between our distinguished panelists who represent leading policymakers from different jurisdictions and representatives from global business and the civil society. We will also have two rounds of Q&A from the audience. So as you listen into the conversations, please share your questions and your comments in the chat, and we will do our best to bring them into the debate. The aim is to make the session as interactive as possible. But as a reminder, please use the chat responsibly to ask questions or share ideas directly related to the discussion. Now, before we move to the keynote speech, I wanted to briefly introduce all of our distinguished speakers present here today. In the interest of time, I will not be able to highlight all their responsibilities and accomplishments, but I do urge you to look them up on our events page. I start with Commissioner Keith Sunderling. Commissioner Sunderling was confirmed by the US Senate in September 2020 to be a commissioner on the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. In this capacity, he's responsible for enforcing federal laws that prohibit discrimination against job applicants and employees because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. Commissioner Sunderling is also actively engaged in providing guidance on the deployment and use of AI at the federal level on these topics. It's a great honor to have you with us today, Commissioner. Welcome. Dragos Tudorake, who is a member of the European Parliament and the executive president of the PLUS party in Romania. He is the chair of AIDA, Artificial Intelligence in the Digital A Special Committee at the European Parliament. And he also sits in various other committees, including the European Parliament's delegation with the United States. Jan Kleisen, 
Jan is currently the Director of Information Society, Action Against Crime in the Council of Europe. His directorate carries out standard setting, monitoring and cooperation activities on a wide variety of issues, including freedom of expression, data protection, internet governance, cyber crime, terrorism, criminal law, fighting corruption and money laundering. Welcome, Jan. Judith Belesch is a member of the Swiss Parliament since 2019 and a strong supporter of digital and innovation ecosystems. She's also the CEO of SWICO, a national association representing the ICT industry in Switzerland. Welcome, Judith. Jean-Marc Leclerc, who is head of EU affairs at IBM. Jean-Marc is also the chair of the policy committee at the Business Software Association and the chair of the Digital Economy Committee at the American Chamber of Commerce to the EU. Dr. Eckehard Ernst, who is chief macroeconomist at the International Labour Organization, where he's responsible for understanding the future of work and analyzing alternative paths for jobs and earnings. He's also a member of EU Parliament's STOA Advisory Board and the president of Geneva Macrolabs. Hello, Ekehad. Angela Muller, who is Senior Policy and Advocacy Lead at Algorithm Watch, a nonprofit research and advocacy organization with the mission to watch and analyze automated decision-making systems and their impact on society. So welcome to all of you. It is my great honor to have you with me today. Now, coming back to the keynote, more recently, we have seen a lot of media coverage concerning companies misusing AI in the employment space, concerns related to lack of transparency, potential discrimination as a result of biases, use of emotional recognition when hiring, and the inability of employees to appeal AI-driven firing decisions. Um, there are also potential fears about surveillance by companies of employees and the power imbalance that this creates. But surely there are also opportunities in AI. How can we find the right balance? It is my great pleasure to welcome Commissioner Keith Sunderling to make his keynote address, which will provide us with an overview of the regulatory landscape governing AI in the US with emphasis in particular on ways that AI can advance or undermine diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workspace. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I very much look forward to the panel with my co-panelists um, after my keynote. But when I was nominated to serve as a commissioner on the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission only two years ago, the notion that artificial intelligence would become a mainstay of human resource department seemed closer to science fiction than reality for most Americans. Fast forward to 2021, and the pandemic has transformed the way we work, accelerating the rate at which employers have adopted AI-based employment technologies. 86% of major U.S. corporations now predict that AI will become a mainstream technology at their company this year and 83% of human resource leaders report relying on some form of technology in employment decision-making. This turn to AI-driven employment technologies did not happen overnight. AI has been involved in decision-making at every stage of the job life cycle for years. It recruits and hires, it evaluates and promotes, it identifies candidates for reskilling and upskilling, and it even terminates employees. It writes job descriptions, screens resumes, chats with applicants, conducts job interviews, and then predicts if the applicant will accept an offer. It identifies employees' current skills and potential skills, tracks productivity, and assesses workers. And if employees fall short of expectations, an AI algorithm may send them a message saying, you're fired. AI is now making nearly all decisions once made by HR personnel. Carefully designed and properly used, I believe that AI has the potential to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace by mitigating the risk of unlawful discrimination. Numerous studies have shown the ways that employment decisions are vulnerable to bias on the part of hiring professionals. For example, one study showed that hiring managers are more likely to favor resumes featuring male names over female names, 
even though the resumes are otherwise identical. Another study showed that African Americans and Asian Americans who whiten their resume by deleting references to their race receive more callbacks than identical applicants that included racial references. Oftentimes, HR executives do not become aware of discriminatory conduct by their staff until it is too late. But AI can help eliminate bias from the earliest stages of the hiring process. For example, an AI-enabled resume screening program can be taught to disregard variables that have no bearing on job performance, such as an applicant's name. An applicant's name may signal correctly or incorrectly variables that usually have nothing to do with the applicant's job qualifications, such as the applicant's sex, national origin, religion, or race. At the same time, AI that is poorly designed and carelessly implemented can discriminate on a scale and magnitude far greater than any individual HR professional. That's because the predictions AI makes about specific applicants are only as sound as the training data on which the algorithms rely. For example, an algorithm that relies solely on the characteristics of a company's current workforce to model the attributes of the ideal job applicant may unintentionally replicate the status quo. If the current workforce is made up primarily of employees of one race, one gender, or one age group, the algorithm may automatically screen out applicants who do not share those same characteristics. Case in point, according to a resume screening tool, the key indicators of success at one company were being named Jared and having played high school across. As an attorney who has dedicated my career to labor and employment law, I want to see AI help employers hire and promote the most qualified employees and help workers find their most rewarding jobs. As a public servant, I am committed to ensuring that AI helps eliminate rather than exacerbate discrimination in the workplace. And as a commissioner on the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I am duty bound to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and to advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. That is why it is a singular privilege to be speaking to you today, an audience that spans sectors and continents, an audience that includes government officials, civil rights advocates, innovators, executives, lawyers, ethicists, and scientists, an audience that represents a wealth of experience and expertise concerning one of the most important challenges of the 21st century, ensuring that technological advances do not come at the cost of civil rights. I come from one regulatory corner of the United States government, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But in my remarks, I will explain how my agency's work fits into the broader regulatory landscape in the United States. I will note recent and ongoing developments relating to regulation of AI in the United States, and I will draw comparisons with parallel developments in Europe. Finally, I will provide an overview of the challenges and opportunities in AI presents in the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. In the last two years, artificial intelligence has become a cornerstone of American technology policy. On February 11, 2019, then-President Trump issued an executive order calling for the creation of a coordinated federal strategy, the American AI Initiative, to be developed through the National Science and Technology Council. Among the initiative's guiding principles are the need to train current and future generations the skills needed to develop and apply AI technologies, the need to foster public trust and confidence in AI technologies, and the obligation to develop and apply AI in a manner consistent with civil liberties, privacy, and American values. In a second executive order, President Trump reaffirmed his administration's commitment to encouraging innovation in AI and promoting the use of AI in a manner consistent with our values as a nation. To that end, the executive order enumerated principles to guide the use of AI in government. First and foremost, that federal agencies should utilize AI where appropriate to improve government operations in a manner that fo fosters public trust, builds confidence in AI, and remains consistent with all applicable laws, including those related to privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. Among the other principles to guide the federal government's use of AI are accuracy, reliability, security, responsibility, traceability, transparency, and accountability. One of the last things President Trump did while in office was establish the National AI Initiative Office pursuant to the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act of 2020. The law was passed as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. It expanded, by law, the American AI Initiative 
previously established by executive order. Acting through the initiative, whoever the president is at the time, now must provide sustained, consistent, and coordinated support for ARI research and development through grants, cooperative agreements, and access to data and computing resources. Notably, the initiative must support interdisciplinary research, including in the fields of law and ethics, to ensure that AI develops responsibly. The law also created the National Artificial Intelligence Research Institutes for the purposes of cross-cutting research into AI. It also requires the director of National Institute of Standards and Technology to support research and development into best practices and voluntary standards for trustworthy AI systems. This includes standards for auditing mechanisms and benchmarks for accuracy, transparency, and verifiability. In fact, three months ago, NIST issued a proposed draft for identifying bias within artificial intelligence. Working with the AI community, NIST identified several technical characteristics essential to cultivating trust in AI systems. They are accuracy, explainability, privacy, reliability, robustness, safety and security, and the mitigation of bias. The draft proposes an approach to identifying bias at three stages of the AI lifecycle. First, the pre-design stage. Second, the design and development stage. And third, the deployment stage and post-deployment stage. Although it is primarily addressed to the scientific community, the document promises to shape the discourse on AI development for years to come. The Trump administration set an ambitious agenda for the responsible and ethical development of AI. And although President Biden has withdrawn a number of his predecessor's executive orders, the ones concerning artificial intelligence remain in place. There are strong signs that President Biden will continue down the path charted by his predecessor. Notably, he has kept Dr. Lynn Parker, a pioneer in the fields of robotics and AI, in her position as the director of the National AI Initiative Office. If early signs are any indication, it seems the Biden administration will likewise seek to develop, improve, promote, and implement AI technologies in a manner consistent with civil liberties and civil rights. Just days after being sworn into office, President Biden signed an executive memorandum establishing a government task force responsible for identifying opportunities to address gaps in scientific integrity policies relating to emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. And in June, the White House formed the National AI Research Task Force pursuant to the National Defense Authorization Act. Efforts to develop a harmonized regulatory framework for AI are in their early stages on the federal level. But state and municipal legislators have also begun to address some of the legal questions surrounding the use of AI in the area where my agency has jurisdiction, employment decision-making. Last year, the Intelligence Video Interview Act went into effect in the state of Illinois. It requires employers to notify applicants in writing prior to a job interview that AI may be used to analyze applicants' facial expressions and consider the applicant's fitness for the position. It also requires employers to provide applicants with information explaining how their AI works and what general types of characteristics it uses to evaluate applicants. Applicants must provide express consent before being subjected to such an interview. However, the law has been criticized for failing to offer a definition of AI or establish penalties for a violation, but it also has been praised as a step towards greater transparency and accountability for job applicants who might otherwise be completely ignorant of the fact they are being evaluated by algorithms. In California, the state legislator is currently considering the Automated Decision Systems Accountability Act, which would create disclosure and accountability requirements for government contractors who use algorithmic decision-making in a manner that is likely to have a high impact on legal rights, health, or economic interests of a natural person. If enacted, all prospective state contractors would be required to provide an impact assessment report disclosing, among other things, the name of the vendor and the version of the automated decision system, a thorough description of the way the system functions, any potential disparate impacts on protected classes, and best practices to avoid or minimize disparate impact. Crossing the country back here to the East Coast, in New York City, the city council is currently considering a bill that would regulate the use of automated employment decision tools. The bill defines this as any system that use algorithmic methods to filter candidates 
for hire or make decisions regarding any condition or privilege of employment. The bill is unique in that it imposes both disclosure requirements on employers and accountability requirements on vendors. The bill requires any employer who uses automated employment decision tools to disclose to candidates within 30 days how such tools are used to assess their candidacy for employment. It also requires disclosures of the job qualifications and characteristics which the tool is used to screen. Additionally, the bill prohibits vendors from selling such tools unless they underwent a bias audit in the previous year, they are sold with a yearly bias audit service at no additional cost, and they are accompanied by a notice that the tool is subject to the provisions of the New York City law. On one hand, state and local governments are to be commended for taking up the issue of algorithmic bias in employment. On the other hand, they risk creating a patchwork of conflicting laws that create more confusion than clarity for employers who operate on a national level. In any case, they underscore the need for federal action in this area of national concern. In this regard, the United States has much to learn from the European Union's Artificial Intelligence Act. The proposal's risk-based approach to the regulation of AI seeks to build trust in the technology by protecting fundamental rights, ensuring public safety, and fostering innovation. To that end, it creates a four-level taxonomy of risk from accept unacceptable to minimal. I will not go into the details of the classifications for this audience, but for now, two things are worth noting. First, AI systems used for employment purposes are characterized as high risk alongside systems used for biometric identification, critical infrastructure, and the dispatch of emergency services. These high-risk systems are subject to robust reporting, disclosure, validation, and accuracy requirements. Second, although in terms far less specific than those in the EU's AI regulation, the Algorithm Accountability Act of 2019, which was introduced in Congress but not enacted into law, similarly proposed a risk-based regulatory regime here in the United States. Additionally, it framed the regulation of AI primarily in terms of consumer protection as opposed to a whole of economy approach adopted by the EU's proposal. So while more modest in scope and less specific in substance, the proposed legislation reflects a fundamental agreement between the EU and the United States on the risks of unregulated AI. Moreover, the Trump executive orders that prioritize the development of national AI policy shares the EU's commitment ensuring that AI is worthy of public trust. Even though federal efforts to come with it, up with a comprehensive regulatory regime to govern AI has largely stalled in Congress, the implications of AI for equal protection and anti-discrimination law have generated bipartisan interest on Capitol Hill. In fact, during her tenure in the U.S. Senate, now Vice President Kamala Harris was a leading voice on this issue. One commentator declared the vice president good news for artificial intelligence fairness. In September 2018, Harris was part of a bipartisan team that co-sponsored the AI and government bill of 2018. The bill would have established an emerging technology policy lab within the GSA to advise the federal government on the use of AI. Only a week earlier than Senator Harris signed on to a letter to the EEOC expressing concern that the use of AI algorithms could perpetuate gender, racial, age, and other biases in violation of federal anti-discrimination law. Together with Senators Elizabeth Warren and Patty Murray, now chair of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which is the Senate committee that oversees the EEOC, Harris sent a letter to the EEOC expressing concern that such disparities could encode magnified gender, racial, and other biases that exist in our society in which the EEOC is working so hard to combat. And last year, a group of senators sent a similar letter to the EEOC asking for clarification of the commission's authority to investigate and regulate instances of algorithmic biases. Similar letters were sent to the Federal Trade Commission. The senators sent those letters to the EEOC and FTC for good reason. Absent comprehensive legislation from Congress to govern AI, it is up to individual agencies to clarify how laws apply to emerging technologies. And with respect to non-military applications of AI, the bulk of that responsibility falls upon the FTC and the EEOC. The FTC is the United States Primary Consumer Data Protection Agency. Section 5 of the FTC Act, which created the agency in 1914, charges the FTC with protecting consumers from unfair and deceptive acts and practices in or affecting commerce. 
The agency has wide ranging enforcement authority to investigate and sue people and companies that violate these statutes within the FTC's jurisdiction. Among these are the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. The Fair Credit Reporting Act applies to companies known as consumer reporting agencies, which compile consumer information that may be used to, for determinations of a consumer's eligibility for credit, employment, insurance, and housing. In essence, the FCRA seeks to ensure that companies do not develop secret databases of personal information for the purposes of making decisions about a consumer's life. To that end, it requires decision makers to notify consumers when an adverse action is taken on the basis of information contained in proprietary databases or investigative consumer reports. It also establishes the right of individual consumers to see and challenge such information. Historically, consumer reporting agencies have included credit bureaus and employee background screening companies. But as technology has grown more sophisticated, the FTC has adopted a more expansive approach to determining what sort of enterprise qualifies as a consumer reporting agency under the statute. For example, in 2012, the FTC entered a settlement with Spokio, an online data broker for allegedly violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Spokio was using AI to scrape information about individuals from public sources and social networks and other online data repositories. It then compiled the information it retrieved into detailed personnel pro profiles, which is sold to HR departments for employment decisions. The fact that Spokio's reports were being used to make employment decisions was, in the view of the FTC, sufficient to make the company a credit reporting agency within the meaning of the statute. Whereas the Fair Credit, Fair Credit Reporting Act focuses primarily on transparency and accountability in the use and collection of consumer data, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act focuses on non-discrimination. The Credit Opportunity Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, receipt of public assistance, or any good faith rights under the other consumer protection laws. It provides creditors um, to provide applicants upon request with the reasons underlying any decision to deny them credit. This April, the FTC issued guidelines on the way these three statutes apply to artificial intelligence. The guidance was to use a legal term of art, short and sweet. It states that the FTC Act prohibits unfair or deceptive practices that would include the sale of or use of, for example, racially biased algorithms. The FCRA comes into play in certain circumstances where an algorithm is used to deny people employment, housing, credit, or other benefits. And the Credit Act makes it illegal for a company to use a biased algorithm that results in credit discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, or because a person received public assistance. Even though none of these statutes refer to AI, machine learning, or algorithmic bias, the FTC's April guidance makes it abundantly clear that the agency interprets them to encompass decisions made by or with the assistance of these technologies. In fact, to eliminate any uncertainty, the FTC's guidance concludes, hold yourself accountable or be ready for the FTC to do it for you. The same could be said for my agency in the employment context when using AI to make employment decisions. The EEOC has far-reaching authority to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and to advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. Many of the laws we enforce predate by over half a century the AI technologies that are being used in employment decision making. But our statutes are as applicable to employers who use AI to make employment decisions as they are to employers who rely exclusively on HR professional. The EEOC enforces Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Equal Pay Act, the AIDS Discrimination and Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Gen Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. These laws protect a job applicant or an employee from discrimination based upon a person's race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity, pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. The laws apply to all types of work situations, including hiring, firing, promotions, training, wages, benefits, and prevents harassment and retaliation. In short, they apply to every type of employment decision that employers are now using AI to make. 
and the EEOC has the authority to enforce them through federal investigations and litigation on behalf of victims of discrimination. There are two theories of discrimination under Title VII, disparate treatment and disparate impact. Under disparate treatment, an employer deliberately treats some people less favorably than others because of their membership in a protected class, for example, their race, sex, or religion. So for a simple example of disparate treatment, if an employer were just to throw away resumes from all applicants of one race, the employer would be engaging in disparate treatment discrimination. Disparate impact discrimination exists when an employment practice that is neutral on its face has an adverse impact on members of a protected class. Here's an example. Let's say a company wants to increase the likelihood that the employees will arrive at work on time every single day. So it decides to hire only people who live in two zip codes, both of which are close to the office. If those zip codes are populated predominantly by members of one race, the policy may have the effect of excluding members of other races from job opportunities, even though the intent of the policy was to make sure no one is late for work. While disparate treatment claim requires a showing of discriminatory intent, disparate impact does not. Therefore, employers are equally liable for discrimination, whether or not they intended to discriminate. So now that you understand the basic requirements of the law, let's discuss an example of how this applies using AI. An AI-driven resume screening tool tested by Amazon between 2015 and 2017 illustrated this well. Programmers fed the algorithm a data set consisting of resumes belonging to Amazon's current employees, along with resumes that had been submitted to the firm in the prior 10 years. Using machine learning, the program was able to identify patterns in the historic data set and then use those patterns to rate new applicants on a scale of one to five based on their resumes. However, because the vast majority of resumes in the data set belong to men, the program began automatically downgrading resumes with certain word combinations, such as women's sports teams, women's clubs, and the names of women's colleges. This was not proof of a misogynistic intent on the part of the AI. It was a function of the data fed to the AI in the first place. When it comes to AI, legal scholars, software engineers, and vendors tend to focus on disparate impact discrimination. However, claims of discrimination by AI can easily and often do fall under the umbrella of disparate treatment liability. Here's an example. In a recent class action suit, a group of plaintiffs alleged that Facebook's advertising practices, including its use of AI algorithms, violated state anti-discrimination statutes. In the court filings, the plaintiffs alleged that a number of companies restricted their employment ads to certain age groups in violation of the age discrimination laws. The lawsuit alleged that employers could create a tailor-made applicant pool by simply ticking off boxes on a list of characteristics. They could check an include box next to preferred characteristics or an exclude box next to disfavored characteristics. Shortly after the complaint was filed, Facebook announced that it would be disabling a number of its advertising features until the company could conduct a full review of how exclusion targeting was being used. And as part of the settlement, Facebook pledged to establish a separate advertising portal with limited targeting options for employment ads. Allowing employers to exclude people from their applicant pool in the manner alleged in that case goes even further than pre-civil rights era job advertisements directly telling people of certain races, religions, or national origins not to apply. It withholds the very existence of job opportunities for members of a protected class on the very basis of their membership in a protected class, leaving them unable to exercise their rights under civil rights statutes. After all, you can't sue over exclusion from a job opportunity if you do not know that opportunity existed in the first place. So in an instance like this, with just a few clicks, AI can help employers engage in disparate treatment on a scale far greater than ever before. Outside the realm of science fiction, AI has no motives or intentions of its own. AI only has algorithms that enable it to correlate data and make predictions. According to industry experts, this is what makes AI so attractive to employers. AI's reliance on hard data creates the potential to eliminate individual discrimination by removing human bias from decision-making. And when AI is designed in a clear and explainable way, it eliminates one of the biggest challenges to effective human resource management, the capriciousness of human tastes. At the same time, the apparently objective nature of algorithm decision-making can result in technological bias on the part of the user. That is, in over-reliance, if not blind trust, that the robots will always get it right. In this case, the user may lose sight of the fact that AI is self-reinforcing and requires close monitoring. 
Employers cannot adopt a hands-off approach to HR technologies because inaccurate, incomplete, or unrepresentative data will only amplify rather than minimize bias in decision-making. Amazon's resume screening program is an example of how biased inputs can yield biased outputs, but it is also an example of how a vigilant employer didn't simply trust the algorithms to get it right. Amazon tested the program, evaluated its performance, and when it proved unworkable, Amazon abandoned the program without ever actually using it to make a hiring decision. But as I mentioned earlier, AI is not just being used to hire, it is being used at every stage of the employment decision-making process, beginning with the very stage to start recruiting. Workplace discrimination imposes heavy human, social, and financial costs. This is true regardless of whether it occurs in the United States or the EU, Beijing, or Buenos Aires. But employers and employees are not alone as they navigate the promises and perils of AI technology, nor for that matter are data scientists, HR professionals, ethicists, and policymakers. This conference is proof positive of that. In the United States, I'm prepared to support employers, employees, and the AI community in this undertaking. The EEOC is a law enforcement agency, but I believe enforcement alone will never be sufficient to achieve our mission. Preventing employment discrimination from occurring in the first place is preferable to remedying the consequences of discrimination. It has been my experience that most employers want to do the right thing. They just need the tools to comply. I have found this to be uniquely true in the AI space. Many of the stakeholders from whom I've been hearing from believe in their algorithms and their potential to promote equality of opportunity in the workplace. I've encountered a community of employee advocates, engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, ethicists, lawyers, and employers determined to get this right. They are willing to discuss their methods and designs, and they are seeking guidance in this area in order to ensure that bad actors do not discredit the entire industry. Government regulators, employee advocates, and employers should all welcome this interest. I'm committed to providing the clarity that workers, employers, data scientists, and policymakers have long been asking for. We cannot fully realize the potential of AI technologies for people and for the global economy unless those technologies are applied in a manner consistent with our laws and our values. I stand ready to help our innovators and employers do precisely that and encourage you to work with me in that worthy enterprise. Thank you for, very much for allowing me to do the keynote and I'm very much looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, now, uh, it was very, very useful. Thank you for this comparative view from the US and, and with specifically with examples. Um, what I sort of took, took away from what you said, Commissioner, was a few things. You know, so overall, you talked about the approach in the USA being very similar to the EU. Um, commitment from the Biden administration to prioritize this topic and, of course, harmonization of the rules across the US. Um, sort of two key agencies that we, we should be looking at going forward is the EEOC, but of course also the FTC, uh, uh, the Federal Trade Commission. And one thing I particularly like was uh, your comment which said the US, US has a lot to learn from the EU. I mean, and the transatlantic dialogue indeed is extremely, extremely important. And the last one, which I quite like, was also that businesses want to do the right thing. It's just about how we guide them in order to achieve that as well. So what I would, how I would, I would, uh, did you, do you not see my camera? Uh, have you lost my video? Oh, strange. Yes, moment, yeah. You have it. Okay. So um, I'll stop and start again the video just in case. Right. Okay. So um, now the way I would like to run this session, I would not want to open to Q&A right now. Um, what I would like to do is in fact to get the input from all of the other panelists as well, have their view as well. And once we have all of that, uh, then perhaps go to the Q&A. So what I would do now is to ask Dragos, because Dragos have also been informed that you might be pulled into the parliament for the plenary or something like that very soon. So what, what, I, what I would like to ask you, and I'm probably going to front load a little bit of my questions, but um, the question would be, of course, now for you to highlight a little bit what the EU approach is with regards to regulation, and what are particularly the next steps in the process? And specifically, since you're a member also of, you know, various committees, AIDA, but also you are, you know, with the delegation with the EU, uh, with, with the US, it'd be good to know in terms of the experience 
or that you've had with regards to the reception of the draft EU AI Act. So I pass the floor to you, Dragos, if you could potentially now share the views from uh, the EU perspective. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to everyone. And, um, uh, apologies for actually having to run a bit quicker than I thought. I was hoping that I could say also for the Q&A. Uh, I would have uh, liked to also uh, hear the audience and, and interact with the other panelists. But I do have a, a plenary intervention on Afghanistan in about 20 minutes time, so, so I'll have to run. Um, but if I finish quick, then I might uh, still catch you uh, live um, for the rest of the, for the end of the panel, and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I will actually start where, where Commissioner Sonderling somehow left it, and also uh, from your conclusions of, of the Commissioner's uh, keynote speech. Uh, because indeed, um, about a year and a half ago, when we started this endeavor, which is now called AIDA, the Special Committee of the European Parliament on Artificial Intelligence, we, um, myself and, and many other colleagues uh, working on that, thought that um, it would not be easy to start preparing the alignment in terms of uh, vision and, and policy content with our transatlantic partners, this being from the very outset an objective of ours. But then in the course of our interactions uh, with, with uh, many colleagues in, in Congress, uh, we've realized in fact how, how close we are. And listening also to the commissioner today, uh, I can only reconfirm that, uh, the fact that although we are starting a bit from different uh, points in terms of how we are preparing the legislation simply also because we have different cultures in that regard, uh, but the, the underlying fundamental elements uh, underpinning what we want to achieve with these regulations uh, are, are pretty much the same. And while the commissioner was elegantly saying that the US needs to learn from the EU in that regard, I would reciprocate and say, I think we, the European Union also, stand to learn a lot from how US approaches uh, and has approached uh, the development of, of AI and also the view of the administration of the government of the state towards this, uh, because what I believe we don't do enough and you do uh, on, on the US side is to actually uh, invest and focus investment uh, to, to stir up uh, creativity, to stir up um, innovation uh, and, and focus very much on projects that, that can be uh, providing those quantum leaps in terms of uh, how development of such a, a, a technology goes. Uh, but I will come back to, to, to this dimension of our uh, EU-US dialogue and also some of the next steps uh, that we have in the coming weeks and months planned um, towards the end. Um, picking up another challenge, uh, which is to say where we stand today with legislation. I'm not going to go too much into the detail. I work on the assumption that by now, a couple of months down the road, I think many in the audience, uh, since you are interested in this topic, you've probably uh, read through the Commission proposal. What I think is important to say is the Commission has followed the brief, um, a brief that came from uh, earlier work that had been done at the level of the European Commission, at the level of the European Parliament, in the national constituencies as well, national parliaments, governments, strategies that had been adopted. Uh, by, by various governments uh, in, the, in the member states of the Union. So there was already uh, a flurry of activity and of, of uh, let's say, um, foresight in terms of how AI regulatory framework should look like. And with the white paper that the Commission launched at the, at the start of the mandate and with the consultation and the feedback that it received during that process, uh, they had put forward this draft, which you mentioned uh, at the start uh, in April, which again follows the brief, follows the brief of putting forward the framework for ethical human-centered AI. What ethical and human-centered AI means is very, very much putting the interests of, of individuals at the heart of, of this regulatory framework and in a way regarding the development of the technology through the lenses of what uh, is uh, the, the, what are the interests of the individuals, what is essential to prevent prejudices, bias, uh, and to make sure that whatever happens in terms of development of algorithms or the data that is being fed into, into those algorithms 
are respecting a certain criteria. And then there, are, there is a little bit of risks. The commissioner also mentioned himself, uh, himself the approach with uh, applications that are simply prohibited, the four categories, and then uh, following gradients, which are described in the legislation for big uh, categories of, of algorithms and applications, uh, with also uh, clear examples given as to what is high risk, what is a low risk, all the way to those which are not risk at all, and therefore there is no need for regulation. I think what would be interesting to, to, to point now is what I believe, uh, based also on the uh, interactions and the hearings that we've organized in AIDA over the course of, of the last year, what I believe, is, what I believe will be the main trade-offs the main battle lines in political terms uh, here in Parliament, because although, like also Commissioner Sonderling said, also here in the European Parliament, there is more or less a consensus uh, between uh, MEPs as to the fundamentals of how AI uh, needs to be developed, there are certainly uh, political fault lines uh, from the left to the right as to what is important and where, where is the sweet spot in terms of of what needs to be in legislation and what needs not. And the first category, of course, is the balance between rules and, and incentives. On one hand, yes, we all say we want to uh, put the right set of boundaries around the development of AI because it's necessary, because it's necessary to protect the human interests and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, we all want that AI uh, remains the technology that helps our economic growth and that we are providing the right incentives for innovation, for creativity, for development of AI in the European Union, because we remain very much committed to stay in the global race um, for, for these cutting edge technologies and remain there a relevant global player, not only in the way we regulate things, but also in the way we stay competitive and we develop uh, benefits, economic benefits uh, for that. So, finding the right balance between how do we regulate and how do we uh, make these prescriptions in terms of, of the rules that need to be set up, uh, how the explainability, the accuracy burden uh, that companies would have to, to uh, abide uh, with in order to uh, comply with the new legislation is something that needs to be very well balanced, fine-tuned in the way we would be negotiating this text in Parliament and also with the, with the Council, so that again, this balance is, is, is found. For me as a liberal politician, uh, this uh, remains is one of the key uh, expectations, one of the key objectives during these negotiations. The second one is to get the definitions right. Um, it's quite a challenge to provide in legislation bulletproof definitions, particularly when you want to state very clearly, okay, this is what is absolutely prohibited, you cannot do, uh, this is what is high risk, and therefore uh, it comes with these set of requirements of what you need to do in order to comply with legislation, and so on and so forth. So those definitions remain in a way fundamental for how uh, this legislation will be understood and will be afterwards brought out, applied, respected, and enforced. And this is where I have heard over the last couple of months, since the publication of the text by the Commission, I have got quite a number of, of question marks even criticism coming from certain parts of the industry, but not only industry, also civil society and academia, because some of those definitions uh, uh, seem to be too, too strict or too vague. And I mean, in both situations, it's something that we don't want to, to, we don't want to do. Um, having a vague definition, and I personally consider that particularly for those uh, that are describing the prohibited applications, uh, there is need for clarity, and I expect we'll be working quite a lot on, on uh, providing that clarity for those definitions, but also uh, in the way the use cases uh, for the high-risk uh, applications, uh, the way the definitions for those um, I put in the text, I think also uh, there we will have quite a lot to, to work on. And this uh, brings me to something that uh, grows very much as a conversation here in the European Parliament, but not only, which is when it comes to the definitions and the text, the text itself, how will we manage to make sure that these remain future-proof? So how will we make sure that, in a way, these definitions would remain adaptable over time 
to reflect also the way the technology will, will, ev will evolve over time. And the Commission has provided for some mechanism in the text um, with the use of, of uh, comitology procedure. It, it is basically a much simpler version of, of uh, legislative processes in the EU, which allow you to, to uh, amend certain annexes of the text via a, a shorter, simplified process that is meant to uh, make the adaptation of definitions for high risk categories, for example, uh, adaptable that way. But will that be enough? Uh, that's that's a, a very important question. And then also um, is, and I I can pick up also on something that the Commissioner Sondering was saying, giving all these examples of how also at state level and in different sectors, uh, different pieces of, of regulations have been introduced to regulate uh, bits and pieces of, of uh, applications of AI. And I think one of the, of the big tasks uh, that cannot be, uh, how should I put it, minimized in terms of impact over the coming years, once the AI Act is being implemented, adopted and then implemented, rolled out in member states, is to perform some, some sort of an AI fitness check for other pieces of legislation that are regulating other sector, other walks of life, um, because those may need adaptation as well if we are to make AI easily applicable and also the rules about AI easily applicable in the member states. Um, Last but not least, uh, a third uh, trade-off and, and big battle uh, line um, in the European Parliament will be on governance. Uh, the Commission has put forward, has imagined a governance uh, for AI in general and how the legislation will be uh, implemented in the Member States with, with the board at the level of the EU and the national authorities which are meant to take on quite a a significant chunk of the responsibility in terms of uh, enforcing the rules um, and, and becoming a bit the regulator uh, at the national level, which from my point of view, not only mine, for many here in European Parliament, uh, risks fragmentation. Um, and that is, uh, that is something that we absolutely don't want to do because it's the ability of, of playing the entire 500 million uh, EU market that is one of the big economic advantages that we want to actually capitalize when, when developing AI. And therefore, I expect that there will be quite, uh, quite a debate here in Parliament and quite a, a, a central part of the negotiation on how we actually will be, um, will be designing this governance uh, to to, to, to compensate for that risk of fragmentation, at the same time also to stand the test of time in terms of how the companies, uh, the, the, the industry, the businesses that will be developing and using AI will interact and will play out with that governance. And this brings me, and I'll, and I'll close now, on, on where I started, which is the idea of reaching out and going global. Um, Whatever rules we create now, and uh, in terms of next steps, very briefly, we're looking at probably two years, starting from now, we're still debating here in Parliament as to which is the responsible committee. Uh, the, internal market, the Internal Market Committee was initially uh, assigned as, as the main lead for the negotiations. Uh, Libre Committee is now also uh, challenging that attribution, asking to be co-responsible. Uh, a decision on this has not yet been taken at the level of the European Parliament. So we are now also caught in this uh, committee struggle, uh, which is not the first, uh, probably you've seen it with the DSA DMA as well. Um, so uh, we will see exactly who uh, will be the responsible committee um, and how the negotiation will start. But anyway, we're looking at, at one to two years of negotiations. That is my estimate. Uh, so that's in terms of, of timing. But what I think we need to do in the meantime, uh, and I link it to what the Commissioner was also saying. We need to, to uh, strengthen uh, the work that we can do across the Atlantic as part of the Trade and, and Technology Council, but to develop also the parliamentary uh, dimension of that. Um, and there are some, some good sites for that. We uh, most likely, uh, representatives of the AIDA committee will travel to the US uh, sometime in early November, and we'll meet physically, hopefully, uh, the, the, the pandemics will allow for that, but we'll meet physically with our colleagues in the AI caucus in, in the Congress, and we'll have a first face-to-face -face conversation on how we can actually align objectives and, and, and content and, and vision in terms of developing commonalities between how we uh, will uh, regulate AI and how the US side will regulate AI. 
And I think this conversation about convergence on AI objectives will remain central to also the, the, uh, the highest level of interaction uh, on the transatlantic dialogue. Uh, the signals uh, for that have come from the very early stages of the launch of the, of the new, um, let's say, the, the, the new incentivized uh, transatlantic uh, conversation uh, after the, the Biden administration took office. So I'm quite optimistic that we will manage to, to see eye to eye on this. I think the interest is there. We are like-minded when it comes to understanding values and, and democracy and fundamental rights in the same way and wanting AI as any technology for that matter to, to develop in, in ways that is congruent with those values. And there also, if we want to play the global stage, we have an interest, both the US and the EU, uh, to develop uh, standards, uh, to develop rules uh, that would also um, be valuable in the way that the, the entire global market of AI um, unfolds and certainly when it comes to how we uh, will interact with China, the other player who certainly uh, understands the use of AI in, in very different terms than, than the US and the EU do. So uh, again, quite, a, quite, a, quite an important common interest there which uh, makes me optimistic that together uh, with the US we manage to, to prepare the rulebook uh, of the future for AI. Thank you very much again. Uh, I hope I haven't taken too long. Um, and as I said, I now have to, to run, but I'll try to, to revert back. Um, and if I still, uh, if you're still on, uh, I can also take some questions again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dragos. And I think it would be great if you could come back because one of the things you talked about, which which in the trade-offs, was between rules and incentives. And I think we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, which is extremely key. Uh, but before. Before we go there, I think I'm going to now pass the floor to Jan, because Jan, um, here we would like to hear a bit more about the Council of Europe. Um, as we, 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 I mentioned before, it's of course a well-established rulemaking body with a membership which is much broader than the EU. And it's been very recently very, very active with regards to AI policy recommendations. Now, whilst I think some of us have been following what's happening with, with the Car High Committee and some others, I think what what is most important for us to know is how is what is being done at the Council of Europe different from what the EU is proposing? So for that one, Jan, please let us know uh, what you think. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Aisha. Thank you very much. And also one thanks to the, to the previous speakers. Indeed, as you said, the Council of Europe has a much wider membership than the European Union. And... Uh, uh, it is perhaps interesting to note uh, from the start that for our work on AI, we who are we bringing together? Who's sitting at the table at the Council of Europe when we talk about AI? Because that is already a difference with uh, with what we just heard of the European uh, about the European Union. The Council of Europe has forty seven member states. Uh, every European country, with the exception of Belarus, is a member state of the Council of Europe, and we also have five observer states: the United States. Canada, Mexico, Japan, and the Holy See. Uh, they're all sitting at the table when we discuss AI. And the governor of Israel has made a special request to be admitted to these talks, and that has been uh, granted. So we're at 53 states. And in addition, we bring uh, civil society and business at the table. And what are we discussing at the table? Um, our foreign ministers, so the foreign ministers at ministerial level of, of 47 countries, decided that uh, two years ago uh, that the uh, risks posed by artificial intelligence, the use of artificial intelligence systems, especially by governments, but also by the private sector, uh, to the core values the Council of Europe was set up to promote and defend, namely human rights, rule of law and democracy, our trinity, if you like, Holy Trinity uh, had to be uh, had to be examined uh, with a view to establishing first of all whether uh, there was a need for an additional legal framework or to see whether existing legal rules were sufficient to ensure that uh, the use of AI systems by governments respect human rights and rule of law and democracy and secondly um, if that were not to be the case to start uh, identifying the elements of a future, of a new legal uh, system, a new legal framework. Now, um, we started that work in, 2000, in 2020, 
And in 2000, uh, to end of 2019, sorry, and by December last year, the Council of Europe published its feasibility study, uh, which came to basically the following conclusion. Yes, uh, there are international standards and national regulations that apply to AI, but no, they are not sufficient. There are important gaps in the protection of human rights and the respect for the rule of law when it comes to regulating, legally regulating the use of AI systems by governments and also the use of such systems by the private sector. And in fact, I think the keynote speech of Commissioner Sonderling pointed out uh, the risk of both uh, risks that can happen uh, through government use. It was in his specific sector, but I think the very telling examples, and we have European examples, very much going in the same direction. Uh, job agencies, for instance, in some of our member states, uh, whose AI systems were found highly discriminatory. Um, so the, uh, the, importance, uh, the important conclusion was we need ad additional uh, legal regulation. And the unanimous conclusion uh, was of the special committee that was set up for this purpose. And that's the table I mentioned, and you refer to it, I share when you gave me the floor. It's called CAHAI, the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Um, it reported to our governments. And our governments gave it a mandate to uh, proceed towards the end of this year, uh, to the end of this year, sorry, not towards, to the end of this year, uh, to uh, identify elements for a future possible IA treaty. And at ministerial level, again, it, we had a session in Hamburg of our foreign ministers. Um, it was decided that uh, negotiations on the actual treaty would then uh, start in 2000, May 2022. So what is the real difference with the EU? As we just heard uh, from Dragos, the EU approach is very much a, a market, internal market approach to ensure that the products, AI products are safe and are uh, in, in conformity with, uh, with standards. Um, the Council of Europe's scope is, is slightly, is complementary, uh, not only in the geographical scope, uh, but also complementary in, uh, in the substance. Because what we aim at is to ensure that governments, when they use artificial intelligence systems, in other words, when they delegate uh, tasks that were traditionally carried out by human actors to machine systems, that they ensure that uh, there are safeguards in place to ensure uh, that uh, the, this application, this use of automated systems, of AI, will not interfere with human rights uh, and, and, and rule of law, uh, but on the contrary, of course, promote them. That's the first obligation of governments uh, that we would seek to achieve. And uh, the commitment of governments uh, to uh, accept binding legal norms on this. And the second is that uh, government should also, of course, ensure that private actors within their jurisdiction also do not violate human rights through the use of automated systems or artificial intelligence. So that's a double obligation uh, for member states. And it's in fact an obligation. These are obligations that are found, for instance, in the European Convention on Human Rights, where governments themselves should respect human rights, but also ensure that within their jurisdiction, others respect human rights. Um, the uh, important uh, uh, issue here is to, uh, arrive at a consensus on, on, on the binding nature. And that is very much the debate at the moment to see uh, which provisions should be binding and where it would be uh, sufficient to have what is called here in Strasbourg in the jargon soft law, whether policy recommendations could also be sufficient. Uh, to give you an example, there is, there is wide consensus, convergence, that when it comes to very invasive uses of artificial intelligence, and I'm thinking, for instance, about facial recognition by law enforcement, that uh, where the uh, possible uh, interference with human rights is huge, that for such invasive uh, measures, there should be uh, very strict rules. There's, in fact, also a debate on whether uh, such uh, methods should be allowed at all. Uh, possible red lines. There is a big debate on that. Um, there seems to be convergence uh, at the moment between our member states and, and the others at the table that uh, the use of, of artificial intelligence by public authorities should not lead to a social credit system. 
We know that in other places in the world, and notably in China, uh, there are social credits uh, which are uh, uh, attributed uh, or detracted through the use of artificial intelligence systems. And there seems to be convergence that that, for instance, in our legal instrument should be a red line that governments should commit not to use artificial intelligence to in any way uh, assess the, the the credit, the social credit, or the social response, the social behavior, I should say, of their of their citizens. Um, we are working with the European Union. I should I will come to a close uh, in order to respect the time. We are working closely with the European Union. They're also at the table in our in our in our committee. Um, uh, we make uh, frequent references to their work, and of course, we, we uh, uh, on the basis of reciprocity. Uh, trust that they will do the same. Actually, today we will launch a joint website together with the European Union, uh, European Union UNESCO, the World Bank Group. Um, uh, it is called Global Policy AI, and it is a, um, a, a common website of uh, eight international organizations. Um, also, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, I said OECD, UN, uh, UNESCO, World Bank. Uh, where we bring together our work on artificial intelligence. So global policy AI will give you an overview of what is happening in the different in the different uh, international organizations. But once again, whereas the European Union focuses on the products, we very much focus on the behavior on, on the uh, on government policies in order to ensure that the human rights of citizens are respected. Thank you very much, Ish. Thank, thanks a lot, Yeah. So I think that's 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 quite clear actually. Um, now, in the interest of time, I see now that we are, uh, we are running a little bit behind. So what I will do, um, whilst I'm tempted to open to Q&A, because I think there's a lot that has been discussed, what I would quite like is for the others to also have a say. So I'll, I'll just keep moving forward. I'm going to pass the floor now to Judith. And Judith, um, you are, of course, representing Switzerland, um, a country which is not a member of the EU. I mean, how do you view uh, the developments in the EU on AI policy? And, and is Switzerland's vision similar to, what, with you, to Europe with regards to this topic? Um, Thank you very much, Aisha. Thank you very much for having me um, this afternoon. Yes, Switzerland is not part of the EU, but we are in the midst of the EU, so very much dependent on the EU market and very close also from, from, a, from a geographical, but also from an economic point of view. Um, we cannot take part in all this regulations effort because we don't have an institutional dialogue, unfortunately. However, we uh, suffer from the full uh, impact of this regulation because of its extraterritorial effects. So this is a difficult position to be. What is more difficult is obviously that the Swiss government at the moment doesn't see any um, necessity to move um, and to have a known put to develop a known position or at least to move towards the EU to have a part in this development. We are nowhere near an AI regulation in Switzerland. I must I must tell you we have we don't have a draft, we don't even have a proposition, we don't have an, even discussions around a, AI regulation. But also um, it's not exactly our style. You know, we are not, typically we're not the fastest in regulating technology. Uh, even more, we prefer not to regulate technologies at all. We are technology agnostic. We don't see much use in regulating single technologies such as AI or anything else. It would be in our view, our favorite example is the knife, probably because of the Swiss army knife. We would never uh, regulate a knife because it could be dangerous to anybody. You can use a knife to cut bread. You can also use it to stab someone. So we prefer to look at the outcome rather than the instrument, the tool or the technology, which is why um, typically we would not regulate a signal. Also blockchain, we, have, we are reluctant to regulate blockchain. We prefer to regulate the financial market altogether. So this is our style. This is also our DNA. We must also say that we are a di direct democracy. So we no, not only do we elect people uh, for the parliament who, who 
make a laws, but we vote every three months on very specific laws. So regulation in our uh, point of view is something very slow and very difficult also to find um, enough people to support it. Um, for instance, we even had a vote on whether cows have a right to keep their horns. So if you want to go and regulate AI, this is, this is going to be a very difficult um, discussion. Um, for this, we have a very long tradition of soft law in Switzerland, and that uh, functions very well. Industries regulate themselves, and maybe we'll have the opportunity also to talk about soft law. Soft laws. I have five now an institute, I believe, in Arizona, U.S., who has compilated a library of over 600 AI soft laws that that everybody can use. So I think that is that is some, something very good. Now to come back on maybe some examples that uh, Commissioner Sund Sunderling has um, explained to us on the bias and on discrimination. Of course, we also want to prohibit um, this discrimination, but all the examples and all the exa um, explanation that we got were fundamentally human made. So it's the data set that humans have chosen to train their algorithm. It's not the AI that have chosen to discriminate people. It's people who have, it's the history of people who have brought this outcome. Also, uh, the social scoring mentioned by Jan Kleisian. I believe fundamentally that no state should be allowed into social scoring of the people, regardless of, its AI, of whether it's AI-based or not, which is, I, which is why we believe to look at the, it's better to look at the outcome than at the means or the technologies that um, get us to this outcome. Very, 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 very interesting. So ideally what you're saying is it's a different mindset altogether. You know, you're not regulating technology, but you want to look at the outcomes, which is quite different maybe in terms of approach. Uh, for the soft law, just for you to say, there's a next panel after this one where we would particularly be looking into soft law and all, all and, and there would be a fantastic presentation about what currently also exists globally and how, you know, that works or not works and some takeaways. So that, that that's obviously something for, for also the audience uh, to go into. Now, thank you for that, Judith. I will now, um, would, I'd like to have, of course, now the view of the private sector. So I'll pass the floor to Jean-Marc and, and Jean-Marc, I mean, obviously there has been a lot of discussions with regards to the impact that technology, you know, the new EU AI draft probably has on producers of AI. And some, of, some are sort of saying that, you know, the, the constraints are maybe too much. Now, what is your view as IBM uh, on this particular uh, issue and also in general on the EU AI draft? Well, thank you very much, Aisha. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and thank you for having me, and, and thanks for your for your question. Um, I, you know, I would say that actually there's a lot of good elements in the in the Commission's uh, draft regulation, and maybe maybe I can give you a few pros and cons if you if you want, and uh, and answer your question on general purpose as well. Uh, as some of the pros, I would say one thing that is really good is that it is based, it has a risk-based approach. Uh, I'm sure many of you will have seen the, the different levels of risk uh, that are regulated in this uh, in this draft. Uh, it's, it's a very good thing because it's proportionate. It's a proportionate approach that regulates use cases, but, but not the AI technology itself. A bit like Judith was saying about blockchain, don't regulate the blockchain technology regulate the use of it. Uh, so that the risk-based approach is a very good thing. And you will have seen that most of the regulation is about um, rules on those high-risk uh, users of AI. And users or intended users, that's that's the key point. It's very good that the that the focus is on users and intended users and non, not on the AI systems 
uh, that are used uh, uh, themselves. And uh, Dragos was saying that it's very difficult to define this or that. He's right. Def definition of AI is difficult. Definition of high risk is difficult. I think, though, that regarding high risk applications, the Commission is quite right to focus on, um, on specific harms to people, you know, harms to your health to your life, to your fundamental rights. I would agree with this kind of definition of, a, of high risk. And the requirements for all the high risk users, frankly, they're, they're very close in general to what the, um, the high level expert group that the, com the European Commission set up uh, a couple of years ago uh, recommended. So it, it's good to see the continuity uh, between the work that's been done in the previous years. There are all kinds of other good things, uh, and, and not just on high-risk AI, even for lower-risk AI, the fact that you would have a minimum transparency obligation is a good thing. You know, everyone should know when they're interacting with an, with an AI system, for example. Um, and um, the possibility for uh, regulatory sandboxes is, is, is an excellent idea. It, could be more about that in the text, but it's good that it's there. Uh, and and uh, you know that the regulation regulates AI as a product. So you have to go through a, a conformity assessment for some of the products. Here again, it's very good that there is uh, room for to use harmonized standards, self-assessment of, of, of conformity for some of the products. That, that's all very good. So just a few examples of the of the pros. Now back to your point, it's true that for Many companies that uh, produce AIs or, pro or provide AI or deploy AI or use AI, you want to know what it is that you have to do. It needs to be quite clear in the in the regulation. And it's true that for a, in particular, for a B two B company like uh, like IBM, the allocation of responsibilities should be a bit clearer. In particular, you mentioned those general purpose tools, which are tools and APIs which are building blocks of an AI system. They are not yet, an, or they are not an AI system. Then when fed with data, for example, by the user, they can become an AI system, but they're not yet an AI system. And IBM and other B2B companies uh, provide a lot of those tools. Uh, and so you want to know what you should do or what you, you shouldn't. And it's true that the text is not very, very clear on, the, on this. And there's a link there with, and I'm going back to the issue of definitions. You will have seen the definition of, uh, of AI in the text of the commission. It's true, it is very broad. Um, now I completely understand the, the, the goal of having a regulation that stands the, the test of time, absolutely. But still, when you look at the definition, the list of techniques that are uh, covered as well, uh, you have, you could put all kinds of software that have nothing to do with with AI uh, in, in this uh, that would fit or that would be in the scope of this definition, including uh, uh, general purpose tools, which are not AI systems per, per se. So that's a bit of, a, of an issue. Uh, and, and maybe two other points on, on what can be improved in the in the text. Uh, we, uh, Dragos mentioned uh, the, the different areas which are uh, classified as, a, as high risk. Um, you know, reading them, looking at them, I'm, I'm not sure that all of them, all the, the uses that are listed would really classify as a, as a, as a high risk use, but maybe we can go back to, go back to that. Um, and then on the requirements, I said that they follow very much what the high level expert group on, on AI proposed, but then you have some uh, requirements there that seem very difficult to, to comply with. Uh, <clears throat> so I hope those will be improved. You have this requirement to have data sets that are complete and free of errors, uh, which sounds like a great uh, goal, great objective, but to do in practice, uh, very difficult. Um, so, you know, I think these are a few, a few areas uh, that are great, others that can be improved. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll stop here, Aisha. Thank you so much, Omar. So, so overall positive, that's what I took down. Um, yeah. The definition is maybe a little bit too broad, and in terms of the high-risk categories, as well as data sets and certain requirements, there is some more work to be done. So that, 
Thank you for sharing that. I will quickly now move to Angela because I think we do need to have a view also from um, you know, Algorithm Watch, which, which of course has been very actively involved in discussions related to AI policy within the EU, the Council of Europe, UNESCO, and also GPAY. So um, in your opinion, um, Angela, uh, does the EU proposal live to its promise? Yeah, thank you very much. Also, thank you for uh, the invitation and also for the co-panelists for the great and very insightful statements. Um, so, of course, it's um, rather a question, so I will not go into every detail, um, but highlight some, some aspects of it. And in general, I just want to say what we welcome, of course, is the, say, agenda-setting character of the proposal and the awareness-raising character. So discussions like today, I think, are also largely sparked, actually, by the proposal. And it really puts the topic on top of the agendas, and I think that's something um, we should welcome. Um, but substantially, of course, we have some open questions. And I will also begin with the, um, the definition, the object actually of the regulation, um, which as said before, sounds very broad. Um, to us, it remains a bit unclear whether such a definition actually serves the purpose and also how broad it will um, eventually be. So in our opinion, like the criterion for identifying the need to regulate should lie actually in the impact systems have on individuals and society and be independent like from the specific type of technology involved. Um, this is also why we choose to speak of ADM systems, automated decision-making systems and not of AI, like highlighting that it's what is essential here um, when we talk about fundamental rights, humans and society, um, then it's the impact of a system. And another general remark on the risk-based approach of the regulation. So what the Act does, um, as discussed before, it categorizes systems into different risk categories. And um, of course, I mean, we welcome, say, the general recognition that the use of AI comes with certain risks. But we don't think that this way of like ex ante categorizing systems into different categories is the way to go. Um, in our view, it is only by looking at a specific system that you can assess what implications it might have and what implication, uh, implications it does have actually over the course of its life cycle. So the, the risks that a specific system should com, uh, comes with should be assessed rather via an impact assessment and on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, this must be like a low threshold um, impact assessment for, for um, systems that turn out to be low risk. And then, you know, the more risk signals you detect, the more comprehensive the requir requirements become. So that is... Um, what we think should be the way to go. Also, because what is a further implication of the Commission's draft is that by introducing such a high risk category, what it does is also it legitimizes and actually legalizes the use of these high risk systems. Um, of course, it subjects them to requirements, but at the same time, you know, these systems are now officially allowed when they comply with these um, requirements. So I think many of these applications um, have not yet been the object actually of a public debate and citizens have not yet had the opportunity to discuss whether there are maybe limits to what decisions should be automated in the first place. Um, and this brings me also to the next point. So um, we very much agree with the important role of transparency, but it's also important to say that transparency can only be a means to an end. It must always be complemented with further measures um, to guarantee accountability. And here we also see gaps and also ambiguities regarding the enforcement of the regulation. And I um, will also just briefly mention some examples to illustrate it. For example, the national supervisory authorities that a proposal foresees, um, in our view, they, they should be equipped like with really the expertise and the resources and, uh, and the capacities to effectively fulfill their tasks. But the proposal foresees at the moment one to 25 full-time equivalent positions per member state would mean like one person in Slovenia and 25 FTEs in Germany. And in our view, this is clearly insufficient. Another aspect is the role assigned, assigned to standardization. Um, of course, standards can be very important, especially in these very technical areas. But um, the procedures leading to standardizations are not really known for their inclusiveness. So they, there might be a democracy deficit also lumping here. And third, and this is um, the most important aspect, what we miss in the proposal is actually the per perspective of those affected. So it says it centers on fundamental rights and it puts the interest of humans at heart, but it actually lacks guarantees um, for 
end users, um, for consumers, um, for those affected. So um, it lacks guarantees for access to information. It lacks guarantees for legal remedies, including collective redress mechanisms and so on. Um, so these are like the general remarks. Of course, we have um, some issues with specific articles, topics. Um, it, there's been a lot of discussions on the ban on biometric recognition technologies, which we think is um, has a lot of exemptions and limitations. Um, for example, the limitation to law enforcement authorities, to real-time recognition and so on, that we think um, this ban will not be able to really preclude all forms of mass surveillance in public space that are inherently incompatible with fundamental rights. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Sorry to just, you know, because I, I, I see yeah. that there's a lot going on in the chat as well, and we have, uh, we, I'd like to bring it into the discussion, and we still have Ekehard. So Ekehard, I'll, I'll just pass the floor to you very quickly now, and of course, as as member of the STOA at European Parliament, as well as, of course, an expert in global labor markets, I'd just like to ask, what is your view? Because I think another, another topic that comes up, and with regards to how workers are treated by sort of in within this AI ecosystem. And we have quite a few sort of documentaries uh, that have come out on that as well. So Ekehad, the floor is yours. And then uh, next is going to be Q&A. So I hope um, uh, we have a lot of questions. Listening to you now, Ekehad. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, and thanks for being here. Excellent discussion so far. I mean, there's already a lot of ground, uh, ground covered here with, with uh, all of uh, my co-panelists. I wanted to stress one thing, uh, which is uh, to say that um, as much as I uh, support the uh, the risk-based approach that uh, that the EU is taking, and I understand that uh, also from the US side, this is uh, something they're, um, they're focusing on, I do think that indeed the um, the the um, the focus on governance has been missing so far. To kind of how do we actually implement uh, uh, these regulations? How do we make sure that they work properly? And and here I don't I see uh, see some some. Uh, at least missing elements uh, that um, that need to be filled. Um, I mean, I do see that the um, the importance of soft law as as one one possibility to uh, to kind of rely on a much more hands off uh, approach. But I wanted to warn you, uh, uh, also our maybe our Swiss colleagues here a bit. Uh, the ILO, for which, which I'm representing today, uh, has um, issued a code of conduct uh, back in the late 90s on on worker privacy and, and data protection rights. Uh, and I just read you one uh, one first paragraph in that in uh, the general principle, which was, uh, which states here in, in in section five of this document, personal data should in principle be used only for the purposes for which they were originally connected. Now, anybody who has uh, of you who has used um, these platforms, these uh, these digital tools, know that this is actually not at all respected. So, despite the fact that. Uh, um, we have uh, this, imp these, pr these soft laws uh, available, we actually don't see much of this being pr probably followed through. And part of it is really that, uh, that there is a lack of enforcement, as Angela was already saying, and, and, and a lack of, of systematically thinking about how this, this enforcement, enforcement can, uh, can work in practice. Uh, and one element that I always stress, and I was also stressed that in the discussion with my colleagues from the European Parliament, is that for me there is a lack of proper risk management mechanisms uh, uh, and, and a kind of an ecosystem-wide approach to, uh, to stress testing algorithms. Uh, uh, you have seen, and, and uh, it's good to have Algorithm Watch here on, on board, is that recently um, uh, colleagues there try to uh, uh, try to actually do that stress test of some of the algorithm that Facebook uses and were were harassed uh, out of uh, out of the use of these um, uh, the, the, their own stress tests. So I think that this shows you that um, there's a huge imbalance still on the market, and and I'm really concerned that we don't not we are not working into the direction of kind of creating an ecosystem that really allows us uh, um, to uh, to test uh, to test these algorithms and uh, and make sure that they actually work uh, uh, and identify the uh, the biases that these systems uh, these algorithm can produce. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody uh, of how difficult it is. Uh, um, and when you remember the, uh, the the financial crisis 12 years ago um, was uh, was relying on a on a risk based system which uh, which seemed to be relatively well regulated and nevertheless uh, uh, proved to be totally dysfunctional uh, uh, to protect us from from the financial crisis. So I'm wondering to what extent a, a regulation a regulatory approach that doesn't really focus on on how to create this ecosystem for risk management uh, can really pr pretend uh, pretend to to be able to address these issues. One uh, one specific issue is, is and, and I mentioned this uh, uh, recently in a discussion as well, is for instance algorithmic collusion. 
fusion between uh, between uh, algorithms that are used in different companies. Um, uh, and we don't even know yet how to properly identify whether these algorithms are colluding or not. Uh, and the OECD has published a report some uh, some years ago where they clearly state that we have no way of properly identifying and properly regulating then uh, and then these possibilities, which are uh, usually important for uh, for discriminatory practices on on labor market. <coughs> I wanted to do, um, to to maybe reflect quickly on what Keith was saying at the beginning uh, about um, existing regulatory approaches, and and I Aisha, you just mentioned uh, the importance of. Um, uh, of uh, the platform work. Um, uh, ILO has recently published a report in, in this area and, and what is interesting to observe is that AI, uh, platform works uh, or AI in, in, in general is actually a relatively labor intensive industry surprisingly because labeling the data, uh, um, uh, micro tasks on platform work, uh, delivery service on platform work etc. is, is actually uh, mostly uh, um, very labor intensive and these 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 workers typically are suffering from either over exploit exploitation lack of enforcement of existing regulation etc so interestingly enough we don't for a lot of for a lot of labor market issues we don't actually need new regulation we have the regulation in place we just need to implement them uh, and that requires often that um, jurisdiction need to kind of uh, come to gra uh, grasp with, with these new with these new forms of work with these new uh, um, issues to kind of see to what extent existing labor standards actually apply to uh, uh, to these uh, to these new type forms of work and to what extent for instance uh, social protection needs to be extended to uh, uh, taxi drivers that offer their services on uh, on on uber and lyft uh, whereas as is currently now being uh, implemented in many countries including uh, uh, in in the uk so i think that that we have a lot of regulation we need to implement them so we don't necessarily think about new regulation to, uh, to begin with but rather already think about how we again create the governance that actually allows us to implement these two existing um, uh, uh, to, to these new forms of work and only once we once we identify that there are new forms of discrimination new forms that are uh, that are uh, that, that create uh, um, ne uh, needs for for regulation I think only then we should think about and we should think about new regulation in conjunction with uh, with uh, the proper governance approach that goes beyond simply saying uh, oh we need to implement it at the at the um, at the member country level but as as I, uh, Angela just mentioned rightly so is the, we also need to kind of think about governance in terms of funding resources for uh, uh, overseeing uh, uh, oversight institutions in, in at national level. So I think that for me this is really the key point I take is if we don't think about the governance of these of these regulation, we really miss a large point of of the of a proper ap uh, approach to regulation of these new uh, these new algorithm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's about creating an ecosystem approach and also focus on implementation. Now, thank you very much, all of you. And I'm sure that we, uh, all those listening in, uh, would be really wanting to now participate in the Q&A. So I'm now going to ask Marco uh, to just give us a little bit of a summary of what's happening in the chat and what are some of the comments and some of the questions. And maybe you don't want to go through all of them, Marco, but you might want to just uh, summarize a couple of, couple of them that you think are relevant. Thank you, Aisha. Yes, absolutely. I'll try to summarize them because indeed the discussion was, was very rich. I'll try to group, group uh, the intervention into two or uh, three points. The first one was um, a line of discussion going and debating to what extent decision makers are aware of the biases and the extent of the biases that AI is, is delivering in, in specific contexts. In, in particular, this uh, reflection came after uh, the initial remarks of this panel, and I think the case was that of the employment sector. So Joanna, in this regard, is, is pointing out that AI itself does not make decisions. Organizations make decisions about how decisions should be made and then enforce these through AI. So using AI as an intermediary. Therefore, the problematic aspect that Joanna was pointing out is that organizations that do this by outsourcing the development uh, of AI to a company and then not understanding what is delivered are a problem. And then, uh, as I was saying there, there was a little back and forth with, uh, with other participants, <laughs> myself included, um, and then maybe we can also pick uh, a little bit the brains of our speakers on and to what extent we can uh, we can have full aware awareness more broadly as vision makers on on the biases that are um, that are produced by the machines 
uh, themselves, if there are specific examples in which specific tools, for example, uh, as it is the case for uh, probability softwares that produce a given statistical analysis with a probability associated to it, that means a confidence interval, can be done the same with biases, something along the lines previous answers have registered an X amount or X probability of uh, these specific biases. Uh, I don't know if any of the participants that are here today, as well as the speakers, have any examples in, uh, in this regard. So the first point. And then the second line of discussion was that of liability and responsibility. Uh, in particular, Dylan is asking, how are auditors and unsure assurance reports affected by AI solutions these days? And what quality measures they use in future assessments? In particular, what will happen if an auditor underestimated the risk for critical infrastructure controlled by AI decision making? Or even in another context, how would a business explain their AI solutions and their risk management in a forensic investigation? As, as I was saying, this, uh, the discussion on the uh, liability in the case of AI produced biases, and as you reminded and your colleague also signed a chat, there will be more of these type of discussions on soft law and informants in the next panel, but maybe uh, speakers have already touched a little bit upon that, but clarify vis-a-vis um, -vis the question that uh, Daniel asked. Um, and then we shifted into the problems of regulations of AI, which was the, the last part of, um, of this panel. And, um, the chat was mainly debating about how to regulate something that is continuously developing, how to regulate AI applications. And by the time the regulation is published and enforced, the application is already three steps further. And then the speakers have reflected upon, uh, upon the fact that uh, most of the regulation could and should regard on the outcomes. And in this regard, Joanna is asking a clarification. I do not understand why it's a problem to relate any technology that produces outcomes associated with intelligence as intelligence. Okay. And and uh, I may just close with uh, one comment by by Francesca saying that there are elements of AI systems that need regulation, also regardless of the use and outcomes. Otherwise, you may not even be able to assess how they're used in the case of transparent obligation. All in all, this was a rich discussion that was was uh, concluded concluded with general remarks on what should and should not be debated in a society uh, and automated. Sorry. So what should and should not be automated in a society and more importantly, in a democracy. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm going to just pick a few because I think uh, in the interest of time, we, you know, um, maybe the first one, which actually just is important, is about the regulators actually understanding the issue. And that's the one. So an in, in issue and understanding the biases and to what extent, uh, you know, what work has been is being done and what is sort of expected to be done with regards to, to knowing if the regulators are up to speed with all of these technology te technicalities. Uh, I would probably ask um, Keith uh, to, to, to say a few words on that, maybe quick two minutes and maybe also then Jan. Yeah, so about the regulators making sure we understand this technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point because as uh, you know, in the, in the United States, we're very siloed at our agencies. We specialize in, in, in certain laws and uh, we don't um, cross over into other laws. So for us here at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we know the laws related to workplace discrimination and we know how it applies to every industry and every aspect of the job. But, you know, for me, who's looking at doing uh, providing answers and clarity, it is learning about how these AI technologies are not only being um, used, but how they're being developed. And when I say by developed, I understand that I have limits on, you know, I'm, I'm a trained attorney. I'm not a, uh, a computer scientist or I'm not uh, a statistician to, who's actually developing software. So I know what my limitations are and I know what we do um, very well here. But to, to your point, we want to be, if we're going to do guidance or regulations, we need to be able to speak to the people who are actually uh, implementing these and, and designing these tools. So for us, it's, it's very important to have that uh, input from, from all um, and from everyone involved from all sides. But at the end of the day, from, from our perspective on how the law applies to this, it doesn't necessarily matter um, what the, the scientific code is or what the algorithm is. The EEOC is going to look at the results and, and whether that is um, biased data going into the algorithm 
or it's a discriminatory algorithm in itself that is designed to allow the user to discriminate. For, for us, it doesn't matter. We're going to see what the result is. So yes, we, we, we're we engaging in dialogues with, with the people developing the software and making the algorithm and computer scientists and engineers um, to, so I can better understand it and we can understand it. But you know, for our perspective, um, we know our laws very well and we can see discrimination. So um, we work backwards from that. Thank you so much. Jan, a comment on that, maybe? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's absolutely vital that decision makers know know the issues, and that's why um, uh, within the Council of Europe, our, our um, governments have opted for a multi-stakeholder approach, not to have only governments at the table, but very much also business and civil society. Uh, for instance, all the big American companies, uh, the big tech is at the table. Uh, but we also have, for instance, IEEE at the table, and we have import, We have civil society, Algorithm Watch, we're very proud to have them with us as well, to uh, take, tell us what their issues are, but of course civil society also to speak on behalf of, of the users of the citizens. So to ensure that those who have to decide for governments are fully aware of the different issues. Thank you. Now, coming to the second question. Um, so, you know, um, we heard about the need to have an ecosystem for risk management, and that's what Ekehard talked about. But now from the, from the question that has come in, it, it, it's actually about the development of a new ecosystem. So there's all these auditors which are coming through, and I think it's a very valid question. I mean, how, do, how can we ensure that they are doing the right thing, and who is actually overseeing all these who are supposed to be overseeing the algorithms? So uh, who wants to take that question? Who will, who will, who will regulate the, the, the auditors and who's going to watch over some of these new ones that are coming out now and, 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 and coming up with all of these uh, uh, ways to certify uh, uh, algorithms and, and then basically selling it into the market? Uh, if you if you allow me, because I I brought it in, I might uh, yes. uh, might actually uh, kind of elaborate a bit more on this. I mean, I would say that um, a well functioning um, uh, regulatory market should, in principle, um, have a sufficient uh, competition and liquidity to uh, to ensure that only those who are actually properly regulating, uh, sorry, properly um, uh, identifying risk and and uh, and and stress uh, in these in these algorithms are the ones that will survive eventually. Yeah? I don't think that this is really something that you need to regulate. I mean, otherwise you kind of end in this. In Infinite recourse uh, uh, um, with, uh, with re who is regulating the regulator, the, uh, who, the, who is regulating the regulator. Uh, so I think that you, you, you can you, that you don't find an answer to that unless you have really some you believe somehow in, in market forces that will that will uh, drive out uh, um, the uh, um, the bad uh, the bad auditors if you want. And I think that the problem is really that we don't have that market yet. We don't have a sufficient liquid liquid market. And we and again I come back to my uh, uh, my earlier example about financial market. It was exactly the same problem there. We didn't have a properly regulated financial market. Actually, the regulator at the time needed to ask the financial sector to explain to them what's the what's going on with the latest products. And I think we have exactly the same problem now that we we need to go to uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, etc. to have to have them explain to us what's uh, what they're actually doing and what's what's in the pipeline. I think that cannot be the that cannot be the right approach. We need to ensure that there is sufficient funding to sufficient regulation and we probably need to have some kind of uh, um, uh, channeling of public money to support some of these uh, some of these new startups in 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 the audit system um, and, and, and again I mean this the market for governance needs to be properly regulated and then you will see an ecosystem emerge by itself I don't think that you need to kind of uh, have um, a specific regulation or regulator uh, regulation of these auditors. Now, thank you for that. And I think that brings me to the other theme that I wanted to discuss, but I, I, I mean, we still have 15 minutes, so I'm still gonna try. And that one is about incentive structures. And this is, a, this is something that has come in, even in the morning when we were having a discussion, it's kind of a little bit the elephant in the room, which says, well, you know what? In the end of the day, uh, startups, innovators, they're looking at uh, short-term profit maximization, you know, and, 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 and market incentives. Uh, these are not necessarily the same incentives that maybe the regulators have or NGOs have and the rest of society. So there's essentially this gap that exists. And, 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 and until unless, and some people have the view that until unless something is done about aligning these in incentive structures, you essentially would not necessarily, so you can regulate top down as much as you want, but you wouldn't really have uh, the, 
you know, AI moving essentially towards the good of society, unless you have these two forces also aligned. And, and for that, I think, you know, of course, that's a very big topic, but what I, I wanted to actually discuss, and I think it's coming all the time in all the discussions, is how can policy makers, instead of sort of giving the rules and regulations of, for protecting society on the one hand, but also come up with incentives, policy incentives that can be put in place for um, businesses, private businesses, to innovate for the public good. Um, so that 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 is something, and I, I think maybe Jean Marc, you have you have a couple of ideas on that. Maybe we can quickly kick off like two or three minutes each, and then I'd like to sort of go around the table um, and have some 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 views on that. Um, well, I can't. I'm not going to talk, uh, talk about what what governments should do, but you know what companies should do, and you know companies obviously have commercial objectives, but. I think with certain technologies, uh, it's important for you know providers but users as well to understand that uh, there's something bigger, which is trust. Nobody's going to adopt AI solutions if they can't trust them. We see a lot of companies, and it's great coming out with good principles, and IBM has done uh, has done the same, you know. But uh, this has been going on for some time, and and it's good cool to go from principles to tangible actions and and you know my point is that co companies and users don't shouldn't wait for new rules uh, to be uh, uh, to be adopted to, to take some actions of course there are a lot of very detailed initiatives that providers and users can take I'm not going to go into that but yeah I think there's a bare minimum that companies for example can do to start on that road to trustworthy AI you know just some very simple things uh, about transparency. You know, we have that in the EU regulation, but you don't have that everywhere in the world. If you're using AI, you have a right to know that you are, you know, as a, as a, as a user or as a consumer. Minimum transparency should be there. Um, the explainability uh, point uh, uh, as well. You have a right to know how uh, um, the AI system that you're using is making recommendations or, or even taking decisions in some cases uh, especially if you're in a you know in an area where there can be risks for you as a as an individual but uh, can so, I just stop you there because I think one yes we know that it but but what is the incentive what is the incentive for you know when we are developing these technologies for somebody who's looking for profit maximization to think that way that's the question is that something which is coming through is there some way that we can create that? Or, you know, or it's just about like us thinking that everybody is doing, working for the public good. You know, in the long term, I'm, I'm getting back to my first point, uh, those who are in the, in the business of artificial intelligence, they always have to come to the conclusion that their commercial objectives will not be satisfied if people do not trust their products. Governments can help put this idea forward, but, but companies should take their part as well. Okay, thank you. And and I was just wondering, uh, Keith, would you have something to comment on that one? Yeah, well, from our sure, from our perspective, you know, we're a civil law enforcement agency, so the incentive for companies to comply with the laws that uh, Congress passed and and the president has signed is to not violate the law, to not deal with enforcement, to not deal with lengthy federal government investigations, to not deal with lengthy lawsuits um, where we can get significant damages of millions of millions of dollars and really affect the company's bottom line in that way if they're not compliance with the law. So, you know, we we have a very uh, big push to make sure, obviously, that businesses comply with our law. But where AI can be helpful here is, look, the EEOC's mission is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. So breaking down our mission statement, the first word is prevent, okay? And then the second part of it is to advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. So as a government regulator, yes, you know, the, the first and most important thing is for businesses to comply. But if there is technology out there that will help the EEOC further its mission and eradicate discrimination from the law place, as regulators, we're all for that. So, you know, for, for us, the incentive for, um, for businesses in America is they have to comply with the law. So, but, you know, from the EEOC's perspective, where we have this unique result, uh, unique role of both enforcement 
and education, you know, that, that's really where the incentive is for us here at the EEOC to give employers and vendors and employees that guidance on the use of AI and how it can help. Great. Um, Judith, would you have something to add on that one from Swiss perspective? Well, thank you. I, I, in general, I can endorse everything that John Mark said. Really, um, I, I, it's one to one my speech. I would go even a bit further. I don't think that a government needs to incentivize the industry. I believe that the industry has got commercial interests, and yes, trust is part of it. To have a, susta a sustainable industry, you you need consumer trust. But um, as a liberal politician, I don't see governments in the role of incentivizing specific um, industries. I believe that the role of governments, again, is to prevent damage and to regulate the outcome. So if the industry is sure if they do something wrong, regardless with technology with, um, that they will be accountable for that. So they will put every effort in their technology not to have any damage and not to be accountable for it. But I don't believe that it's a government's role to go and incentivize some specific technologies or products or, or uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. But I think here, that, that's a very valid point. Um, the point really was that, of course, it's not about incentivizing them to innovate. It's incentivizing to, for them to innovate for the long-term public good. And, and maybe, I don't know whether we have an example, maybe Ekehard from sort of uh, another industry, which, which could be relevant here. Yeah, I, I th thanks a lot. I mean, I have to say that I'm a bit more uh, skeptical about um, both the, uh, the capacity of industry to uh, use uh, this or to innovate uh, for the greater good. And, uh, and second, to, that we actually see much of it coming out. I mean, I, as I had uh, uh, several times in, in the past in different audiences already mentioned, I mean, I think that for the moment, um, the big concern that we have at, at ILO with, with AI is that we don't see much of, of the benefits coming out from, from it. I mean, we don't see any productivity gains. We say rising, we see rising inequality thanks to partly to AI and its discriminatory practices. And we don't see any kind of benefits for ecological sustainability. So, I mean, leaving industry to itself uh, doesn't seem to, for the moment at least, to lead to uh, the expected benefits. It's rather like more like what Keith was mentioning before that the industry uses these these tools to make sure that they actually comply with the latest regulations. So it's a kind of a rat race between regulators and industry to kind of ensure that, uh, that, they, that they catch up with each other. Um, I think that one, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to regulate uh, innovation, but I think you can incentivize and actually governance do incentivize uh, uh, um, implementation of new technologies through, for instance, through procurement policies, um, through um, uh, uh, R&D grants, etc. And I think that's that's common practice, including in Switzerland. So I, I would say that we, if you want to identify, for instance, uh, the use of AI in specific areas, for instance, in uh, in uh, uh, combating climate change or, for instance, in ensuring that uh, companies are respecting uh, worker rights, uh, especially in, in low and middle income countries, uh, uh, then I think we can uh, we can kind of incentivize uh, companies by by using specific uh, 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 um, uh, innovation uh, incentives like, as I said, in uh, grants and um, uh, uh, and procurement policies to help them uh, or to 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 accelerate maybe the the implementation of these new technologies in their in their uh, in their domain. Thank you, Ekehart, for that. Now, just one one little question which I had, which I do believe is important also in this, and and this one I would I would probably pose to Angela now. Angela, I mean, of course, the regulations that are being negotiated now, and you are of course following them all. Um, it's very important that they are inclusive. Now, there are of course concerns about about you know voices of maybe a certain certain um, big tech giants perhaps, which are uh, much heavier than the other side of society. Do you think that that, that is correct? And what is your view about that? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, as we've heard, like big tech is actually not against regulation. Um, they're stressing that they want regulation today. So um, as we speak, of course, they're spending tons of money and lobbying efforts um, in Brussels and beyond. Um, but it's not only like direct lobbying, but also like financing of media initiatives and, you know, research centers, you all know that. I mean, there's this impact that has become in a way multi-dimensional. 
but what I think is very striking is that there's really this opacity on it. Like it's very hard to tell what is really the impact. So I'm not saying like platforms destroy our democracy or anything like that, but we cannot really know what the impact is. And as it's really a problem. And um, I think this opacity is to a certain extent also on purpose. It's not just accidental. Um, so as mentioned before, um, for example, by threatening uh, external research projects platforms in a way um, suppress more transparency on how they, they influence our public sphere. And um, as said, we had to, to um, shut down our own uh, research project after threats from Facebook, like to move to more formal steps. Um, and I think that's alarming because if we don't have transparency on the impact of these platforms, then we do not really have an evidence-based public debate on all of that. And if we do not have an evidence-based um, debate and if there's much speculation, then can we really like exert democratic control and can we ha really have informed governance framework? So if it's um, if there's this transparency issue. But what would you like? I mean, if, if we had to fix that, do you have a, a concrete proposal? I mean, if, if is it is it resources? Is it more processes that need to be put in place? What needs to be done? Because this is something which has been talked about a lot. So if you had to give one suggestion to fix that, what would that be? That's why I think transparency, I mean, it has become kind of a buzzword, but it's still important. So we really need transparency approaches. And for example, that includes um, that we need data access for research, or it includes that we need public registers for, for systems used in the public sector and so on. This enables, you know, information for those affected, but also information for researchers, for society to actually take informed decisions. But as I said, it's it's always important to say transparency is only like this first necessary step. It's of course not enough. Um, we can't say, you know, um, this solves all the problem. We, of course, we need also accountability uh, frameworks. Thank you so much. Um, I see that we're running out of time. I don't believe we have time for other Q and A's, but what I would like is maybe a one minute or less speed round from all of our, our, our panelists, just very quickly, some last thoughts. And even if we go two or three minutes over, uh, that's okay. So I start with, um, with you, Keith, uh, please share with us last words. Well, well, thank you so much for having me, for putting this presentation together to my fellow panelists. This has just been a wonderful discussion. But from, from my perspective is that we are, it is such a unique time for AI where you have, we know the technology is out there, we know it's being implemented, but the global community is coming together because they know the benefits of this technology and they know it's not gonna go away. So because it's largely unregulated here in the United States, in, in Europe, in EU and other uh, around the world, it's really a unique time where we can come together and just have this global discussions and continue these global discussions to make sure that it, what AI is being used ethically. And it really helps all the different areas. You know, you heard from me about uh, how AI can help in the labor and employment world uh, and, and in HR, but for everyone out there in every industry, it's coming and it's going to affect everybody. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to that we can have these discussions and that we can continue on the conversation as we really, um, as nations come together to regulate this in the proper way. So we're all on the same page. And, and again, thank you for this platform. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Jan? Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's the year of anniversaries. Uh, 40 years ago, uh, the Council of Europe established the first treaty ever on data protection. Uh, which was very revolutionary at the time and which in a way is the grandmother of the GDPR, for instance. 20 years ago, uh, we established the first treaty uh, on cybercrime, which is still a global benchmark. It's the only global benchmark. It has nearly 70 states adhering to it. And uh, we were active in 130 countries last year. So I very much hope that 2022 will be the, the next year, will be the year of a treaty on AI, because I really think we need global standards uh, binding standards. We need a treaty on essentials when it comes to how governments use AI and how governments allow others to use AI systems when that really affects the citizens. That's not to micro-regulate, that's not to regulate in every detail or every possible use of AI, but where AI systems are being used in a way that human rights can be massively affected, the rule of law can be massively affected, or our democratic systems can be massively affected, then I think governments have to come together and have to commit uh, through a treaty, which can be monitored, but can be with, with a monitoring mechanism, 
with supervision to ensure that they comply, uh, to ensure that indeed AI will be a force for the good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean-Marc? Uh, thank you, Aisha. Um, yeah, I just want to, to, to repeat that, you know, it's not because AI is an evolutive technology that it shouldn't be regulated. There are use cases of AI that should be regulated, some even banned. I think it's okay to work for a company and say this. Uh, and I also want to say that it's not because you're a big technology company that you are big tech, right? There are different approaches uh, to research in AI, access to, uh, to what companies uh, do to transparency and explainability. And I just want to make sure we don't generalize going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Judith, last words? Yes, thank you very much uh, also for these last words. Um, this panel has been very enlightening uh, for me. So thank you very much for everybody around the world making comments, uh, some very new um, views for me. And also what's happened in the chat, there were some very interesting comments and questions. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to discuss all of those. What I believe um, is very important that, um, again, we do have a common vision and a common view on um, a global regulation of, of uh, this AI. Um, no country can do that for him, itself. And uh, I believe that our approaches different uh, d differ from one another. And I believe um, my, I have the impression that we are not um, not even we don't even agree on what we want to achieve with this regulation. And maybe that would be a first approach to discuss. However, um, I am very happy to pursue this um, this conversation around the world, also with further continents that were not um, at this table. And thank you again uh, very much for having me today. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Ekehard. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, great, great discussion. Um, just three points to reiterate what I was saying before. I think the first, the first important point for me is let's already implement and enforce regulation that we have and make sure that they applies to these new workers that are, uh, they especially uh, uh, emerge around, uh, around the digital economy and AI, in, and AI in particular. Once we have done that, let's, uh, let's make sure that uh, we identify what's missing in terms of regulation and what is missing maybe in terms of direction of the, of these technologies. Where, where do we want to go this, uh, 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 technology to go? Where, which glo which societal goals do we want uh, this technology to, to, to satisfy? And then third, make sure that once we have the regulation in place, give it the right governance structure, give it the sufficient resources to make sure that the regulation is properly enforced and implemented so that we actually achieve the, the regulatory goals and don't have to come back every, every three years with the same debate. So that's the kind of three points that I hope that I conveyed today. Thank you very much for, for having me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angela. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, the great panel. So just one point, like, um, I think the narrative is often, it's also a bit this AI for good narrative that um, we just now need to use AI to solve like all the major global problems we have, like climate change on, and so on. So the idea is then often also that we now just need to invest in AI research and applied AI also by governments. Um, and of course, we're all for innovation and, you know, using technology. But so far, actually, we don't see all these systems saving the world. So far, what we see in the real world is rather systems like, you know, used for surveilling asylum seekers and stuff like that. So I think we need not just AI research, but really governance framework and governance in the broad sense of the term, not just legal regulation um, in the narrow sense of the term, and also public debate, as I've said. So I think regulators should also be first and foremost in charge of that, in charge of providing these frameworks. Um, and yeah, I think debates like today help. And in the end, um, help to, you know, it's not about fostering trust, like as a means to innovation, but it's really about fostering trustworthiness. Thank you, Thank you so much. And I think that was the whole point of this debate, to bring together all the different views and to listen. And, and I'm, I thank all the participants and also all of you who have been very, very active in the chat. I'm so sorry we couldn't bring all of that in. But just to say that we will be, of course, looking into all what has been discussed. We will be compiling a, a summary publication which will incorporate not just only what we've discussed, but also some of the ideas that have come from the, from, from, from the chats. And we look forward to, of course, continuing this dialogue. Thank you so much for being here.